Chapter Fifteen, Hester and Pearl. So Roger Chillingworth, a deformed old figure, with a face that haunted men's memories longer than they liked, took leave of Hester Prynne and went stooping away along the earth. He gathered here and there a herb, or grubbed up a root and put it into the basket on his arm. His grey beard almost touched the ground as he crept onward. Hester gazed after him a little while, looking with a half-fantastic curiosity to see whether the tender grass of early spring would not be blighted beneath him, and show the wavering track of his footsteps, sere and brown, across its cheerful verdure. She wondered what sort of herbs they were which the old man was so sedulous to gather. Would not the earth, quickened to an evil purpose by the sympathy of his eye, greet him with poisonous shrubs, of species hitherto unknown, that would start up under his fingers? Or might it suffice him that every wholesome growth should be converted into something deleterious and malignant at his touch? Did the sun, which shone so brightly everywhere else, really fall upon him? Or was there, as it rather seemed, a circle of ominous shadow moving along with his deformity, whichever way he turned himself. And whither was he now going? Would he not suddenly sink into the earth, leaving a barren and blasted spot, where, in due course of time, would be seen deadly nightshade, dogwood, henbane, and whatever else of vegetable wickedness the climate could produce, all flourishing with hideous luxuriance? Or would he spread bat's wings and flee away, looking so much the uglier, the higher he rose towards heaven. "'Be it sin or no,' said Hester Prynne, bitterly, as still she gazed after him, "'I hate the man.' She upbraided herself for the sentiment, but could not overcome or lessen it. Attempting to do so, she thought of those long past days, in a distant land, when he used to emerge at eventide from the seclusion of his study and sit down in the firelight of their home, and in the light of her nuptial smile. He needed to bask himself in that smile, he said, in order that the chill of so many lonely hours among his books might be taken off the scholar's heart. Such scenes had once appeared not otherwise than happy, but now, as viewed through the dismal medium of her subsequent life, they classed themselves among her ugliest remembrances. She marvelled how such scenes could have been. She marvelled how she could ever have been wrought upon to marry him. She deemed it her crime most to be repented of, that she had ever endured, and reciprocated, the lukewarm grasp of his hand, and had suffered the smile of her lips and eyes to mingle and melt into his own. And it seemed a fouler offence committed by Roger Chillingworth than any which had since been done him, that— in the time when her heart knew no better, he had persuaded her to fancy herself happy by his side. "'Yes, I hate him,' repeated Hester, more bitterly than before. "'He betrayed me. He has done me worse wrong than I did him.' Let men tremble to win the hand of woman, unless they win along with it the utmost passion of her heart. Else it may be their miserable fortune, as it was Roger Chillingworth's, when some mightier touch than their own may have awakened all her sensibilities, to be reproached even for the calm content, the marble image of happiness, which they will have imposed upon her as the warm reality. But Hester ought long ago to have done with this injustice. What did it betoken? Had seven long years, under the torture of the scarlet letter, inflicted so much of misery, and wrought out no repentance? The emotions of that brief space, while she stood gazing after the crooked figure of old Roger Chillingworth, threw a dark light on Hester's state of mind, revealing much that she might not otherwise have acknowledged to herself. He being gone, she summoned back her child. "'Pearl! Little Pearl! Where are you?' Pearl, whose activity of spirit never flagged, had been at no loss for amusement while her mother talked with the old gatherer of herbs. At first, as already told, she had flirted fancifully with her own image in a pool of water, beckoning the phantom forth, and, 
as it declined to venture, seeking a passage for herself into its sphere of impalpable earth and unattainable sky. Soon finding, however, that either she or the image was unreal, she turned elsewhere for better pastime. She made little boats out of birch bark and freighted them with snail shells, and sent out more ventures on the mighty deep than any merchant in New England, but the larger part of them foundered near the shore. She seized a live horseshoe by the tail, and made prize of several five fingers, and laid out a jellyfish to melt in the warm sun. Then she took up the white foam that streaked the line of the advancing tide, and threw it upon the breeze, scampering after it with winged footsteps to catch the great snowflakes ere they fell. Perceiving a flock of beech birds that fed and fluttered along the shore, the naughty child picked up her apron full of pebbles, and creeping from rock to rock after these small sea fowl, displayed remarkable dexterity in pelting them. One little bird, with a white breast, Pearl was almost sure had been hit by a pebble, and fluttered away with a broken wing. But then the elf-child sighed and gave up her sport, because it grieved her to have done harm to a little being that was as wild as a sea breeze, or as wild as Pearl herself. Her final employment was to gather seaweed, of various kinds, and make herself a scarf, or mantle, and a headdress, and to thus assume the aspect of a little mermaid. She inherited her mother's gift for devising drapery and costume. As the last touch to her mermaid's garb, Pearl took some eel-grass, and imitated, as best she could, on her own bosom, the decoration with which she was so familiar on her mother's. A letter the letter A, but freshly green instead of scarlet. The child bent her chin upon her breast, and contemplated this device with strange interest, even as if the one only thing for which she had been sent into the world was to make out its hidden import. "'I wonder if Mother will ask me what it means,' thought Pearl. Just then she heard her mother's voice, and flitting along as lightly as one of the little seabirds, appeared before Hester Prynne, dancing, laughing, and pointing her finger to the ornament upon her bosom. "'My little Pearl,' said Hester, after a moment's silence, "'the green letter, and on thy childish bosom, has no purport. But dost thou know, my child, what this letter means which thy mother is doomed to wear?' "'Yes, mother,' said the child, "'it is the great letter A. Thou hast taught me in the horn-book.' Hester looked steadily into her little face, but, though there was that singular expression which she had so often remarked in her black eyes, she could not satisfy herself whether Pearl really attached any meaning to the symbol. She felt a morbid desire to ascertain the point. "'Dost thou know, child, wherefore thy mother wears this letter?' "'Truly do I,' answered Pearl, looking brightly into her mother's face. It is for the same reason that the minister keeps his hand over his heart." "'And what reason is that?' asked Hester, half smiling at the absurd incongruity of the child's observation, but, on second thoughts, turning pale. "'What has the letter to do with any heart save mine?' "'Nay, mother, I have told all I know,' said Pearl, more seriously than she was wont to speak. Ask yonder old man whom thou hast been talking with. It may be he can tell. But in good earnest now, mother dear, what does this scarlet letter mean, and why dost thou wear it on thy bosom, and why does the minister keep his hand over his heart?" She took her mother's hand in both her own, and gazed into her eyes with an earnestness that was seldom seen in her wild and capricious character. The thought occurred to Hester that the child might really be seeking to approach her with childlike confidence, and doing what she could, and as intelligently as she knew how, to establish a meeting point of sympathy. It showed Pearl in an unwanted aspect. Heretofore the mother, while loving her child with the intensity of a sole affection, had schooled herself to hope for little other return than the waywardness of an April breeze, which spends its time in airy sport and has its gusts of inexplicable passion, and is petulant in its best of moods, and chills oftener than caresses you when you take it to your bosom, in requital of which misdemeanours it will sometimes, of its own vague purpose, 
kiss your cheek with a kind of doubtful tenderness, and play gently with your hair, and then be gone about its other idle business, leaving a dreamy pleasure at your heart. And this, moreover, was a mother's estimate of the child's disposition. Any other observer might have seen few but unamiable traits, and have given them a far darker colouring. But now the idea came strongly into Hester's mind that Pearl, with her remarkable precocity and acuteness, might already have approached the age when she could be made a friend, and entrusted with as much of her mother's sorrows as could be imparted, without irreverence to either the parent or the child. In the little chaos of Pearl's character there might be seen emerging, and could have been from the very first, the steadfast principles of an unflinching courage, an uncontrollable will, a sturdy pride, which might be disciplined into self-respect, and a bitter scorn of many things which, when examined, might be found to have the taint of falsehood in them. She possessed affections, too, though hitherto acrid and disagreeable, as are the richest flavours of unripe fruit. With all these sterling attributes, thought Hester, the evil which she inherited from her mother must be great indeed, if a noble woman do not grow out of this elfish child. Pearl's inevitable tendency to hover about the enigma of the scarlet letter seemed an innate quality of her being. From the earliest epoch of her conscious life she had entered upon this as her appointed mission. Hester had often fancied that Providence had a design of justice and retribution in endowing the child with this marked propensity, but never, until now, had she bethought herself to ask whether, linked with that design, there might not likewise be a purpose of mercy and beneficence. If little Pearl were entertained with faith and trust, as a spirit messenger no less than an earthly child, might it not be her errand to soothe away the sorrow that lay cold in her mother's heart, and converted it into a tomb, and to help her to overcome the passion, once so wild, and even yet neither dead nor asleep, but only imprisoned within the same tomb-like heart? Such were some of the thoughts that now stirred in Hester's mind, with as much vivacity of impression as if they had actually been whispered into her ear. And there was little Pearl, all this while, holding her mother's hand in both her own, and turning her face upward, while she put these searching questions, once, and again, and still a third time. "'What does the letter mean, mother? And why dost thou wear it? And why does the minister keep his hand over his heart?' "'What shall I say?' thought Hester to herself. "'No. If this be the price of the child's sympathy, I cannot pay it." Then she spoke aloud. "'Silly Pearl,' said she, "'what questions are these? There are many things in this world that a child must not ask about. What know I of the minister's heart? And as for the scarlet letter, I wear it for the sake of its gold thread." In all the seven bygone years Hester Prynne had never before been false to the symbol on her bosom. It may be that it was the talisman of a stern and severe, but yet a guardian spirit, who now forsook her, as recognising that, in spite of his strict watch over her heart, some new evil had crept into it, or some old one had never been expelled. As for little Pearl, the earnestness soon passed out of her face. But the child did not see fit to let the matter drop. Two or three times, as her mother and she went homeward, and as often as supper-time, and while Hester was putting her to bed, and once after she seemed to be fairly asleep, Pearl looked up with mischief gleaming in her black eyes. "'Mother,' said she, "'what does the scarlet letter mean?' And the next morning the first indication the child gave of being awake was by popping up her head from the pillow and making that other inquiry, which she had so unaccountably connected with her investigations about the scarlet letter. "'Mother, mother, why does the minister keep his hand over his heart?' "'Hold thy tongue, naughty child,' answered her mother, with an asperity that she had never permitted herself before. "'Do not tease me, else I shall shut thee into the dark closet.' 